Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Peter Knox, and I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities here at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the opening keynote event in the Baker Nord Center's calendar for the fourth annual Cleveland Humanities Festival on the theme of nature, uh, whatever that means. The Cleveland Humanities Festival is a collaborative event coordinated by the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities during which we celebrate the great educational and cultural institutions of our city and Northeast Ohio. <clears throat> this event and several other events in the uh, festival are supported by the residents of Cuyahoga County, and so I want to especially uh, thank Cuyahoga Arts and Culture for their continuing support for uh, the festival and the Baker Nord Center. The festival provides a platform to explore from the perspective of the humanities, subjects that matter to us as a society and as a nation. This year, we have more than 30 partner institutions offering programs on the theme of nature. Many of you will have already attended some of the lectures, symposia, film screenings, exhibits, and more here on the campus and throughout our city at our partner institutions. And you can uh, pick up programs at the entrance uh, to find out about uh, future events. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here tonight, and I hope that you'll take the opportunity to attend some of those many other events in the festival, most of which are free and open to the public. We have defined uh, 2019's theme of nature very broadly to address the important subject of our physical environment from a var variety of perspectives in the humanities. In our colleges and universities, we are considering our relationship with our physical environment and its representation in literature and the arts climate change, its past history, future consequences, and the ethical problems it presents, and our constantly growing understanding of the science of nature and its impact on culture and society. In theaters and cinemas, we are viewing films and plays that provoke important conversations about how we confront the natural world. In our museums and in exhibitions around the city, we are contemplating the significant events, significance of events such as the 50th anniversary of the Burning River that triggered a wave of environmental activism here in Cleveland and around the country. One of the emerging themes throughout the events taking place around our city is the importance of the perspective of the humanities in contextualizing and, one hopes, eventually coming to grips with the critical realities of our changing natural environment. Our keynote speaker this evening is one of the most important voices in these conversations. Naomi Oreskes, who is professor of the history of science and affiliated professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard University, is a world-renowned geologist, historian, and public speaker. She's the author of over 200 books, articles, and opinion pieces on the role of science in society. In Merchants of Doubt, published in 2010, co-authored with Eric Conway, Oreskes describes how science can be corrupted for political purposes to mislead the public on issues such as tobacco use, pesticides, and the reality of climate change. This theme runs through succeeding publications, including The Collapse of Western Civilization in 2014, Discerning Experts in 2019, Why Trust Science in the Same Year, and her forthcoming book, Science on a Mission, American Oceanography from the Cold War to Climate Change. Oreski supplied the introduction to the Melville House edition of the papal encyclical on climate change and inequality, Laudato Si, and her opinion pieces on climate change have appeared in leading newspapers around the globe, including the New York Times, Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Times of London, and the Frankfurter Allgemeine. Her awards and prizes include the 2016 Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication, the 2015 Public Service Award of the Geological Society of America, the 2015 Herbert Feist Prize of the American Historical Association for her contributions to public history, the 2014 American Geophysical Union Presidential Citation for Science and Society. She's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This evening, Professor Oreskes will explore with us the intersections of the natural world, liberal democracy, and what it actually is that climate change might end. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Naomi Oreskes. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to be back in Ohio. But I have to say, when I hear those introductions, 
I don't really like it because I feel really tired. <laughs> so yes, I've written a lot, and uh, today I'm going to try to the talk today is a little bit of a pastiche from a few different things I've worked on, but particularly um, my book, The Collapse of Western Civilization, which is about uh, the end. So, um, and also I just wanted to say it's really a pleasure to be here also because as a humanist working on climate change, when I first started doing this work, a lot of people thought it was kind of odd for a historian to be writing about climate change, and especially for a historian to be writing about the future, uh, which didn't seem to fit most people's ideas of what historians do. So it's been fun to kind of uh, dislodge people's expectations, but also sometimes a little weird. And it's really nice to be in a place where people are increasingly recognizing that climate change is not just a scientific problem. It's a social problem. It's a problem for humanists um, and really for all of us to be engaged with. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about the question, is climate change the end? And if so, the end of what? In 2014, Eric Conway and I published this little book. It's a small book about the end of the world. And I like to think of it as my accidental book because Eric and I did not have a plan to write this book. We didn't write a proposal or try to get a publisher or a contract. Um, rather, I was asked to write an article for the journal Daedalus about why people weren't acting on the scientific evidence of climate change. And I have to say, I was a bit chagrined when I got asked to do this, because I thought that Eric and I had actually already written that book. <laughs> the whole point of Merchants of Doubt was to answer that question. Why had we not acted on all this abundant scientific evidence of climate change? So I did what all good writers do. I wrote the same book a second time, <laughs> but in a different way, this time as a work of fiction. I had spent, Eric and I had spent five years, read millions of pages of documents, wrote this extremely factual book with hundreds of footnotes. And I thought, well, if that didn't persuade people, if we couldn't persuade people with facts, maybe we could persuade them with fiction. So for those of you who haven't read it, uh, the book takes place in the year 2393. The narrator is a historian living in the Second People's Republic of China. And she's looking back on the past on the occasion of what she calls the tercentenary of the Great Collapse. So I'd like to start the talk tonight just by reading from the introduction to this book, where Eric and I, in our own voices, introduce the idea of the book. Science fiction writers construct an imaginary future. Historians attempt to reconstruct the past. Ultimately, both are seeking to understand the present. In this essay, we blend the two genres to imagine a future historian looking back on a past that is our present and possible future. The occasion is the tercentenary of the end of Western culture. The dilemma being addressed is how we, the children of the Enlightenment, fail to act on robust information about climate change and knowledge of the damaging events that were about to unfold. Our historian concludes that a second dark age had fallen on Western civilization in which denial and self-deception, rooted in, in an ideological fixation on free markets, disabled the world's powerful nations in the face of tragedy. Moreover, the scientists who best understood the problem were hamstrung by their own cultural practices, which demanded an excessively stringent standard for accepting claims of any kind, even those involving imminent threats. Here, our future historian, living in the Second People's Republic of China, recounts the events of the period of the penumbra, which she dates as running from 1988 to 2093, the events that led to the great collapse and mass migrations of 2073 to 2093. So it turned out that an awful lot of people were interested in the end of the world. <laughs> the book has been very successful. Uh, oh, sorry. We have lots of foreign editions, and here's just a few. And one of the things I love about the foreign editions, every foreign edition, the picture takes place somewhere other than the place that the book is published. So you know, the German edition has Big Ben underwater. The French edition has like the Western United States. You know, um, it's all somebody else's civilization getting wrecked. You know, we even have an audio book. So if you don't want to read the book, you can listen to the music. Um, and so it was interesting to us that this little book, which we wrote really fairly quickly um, and really had no plan for, became so successful. 
But in retrospect, I think perhaps it's not so surprising. It turns out that books about the end are very popular. And some of you may have read two famous bestsellers, The End of Nature by Bill McKibben, pertinent to the theme of tonight, and The End of History by Francis Fukuyama, both of which were bestsellers. In fact, the theme of the end of history is so widespread now that there's even a genre about the end of the end of history. And even a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. So he says, all history up to this point has been spent preparing the world for my presence. And the response is, hmm, four and a half billion years probably wasn't long enough. <laughs> if you go to Amazon and Google end of, or put an end of, you get over 50,000 results. Now, admittedly, these are not all bad news stories. There's the end of Alzheimer's, for example, and how to end the autism epidemic, although unfortunately that one is a vaccine rejection polemic, so I'm not recommending it. And it seems that in general, people are actually more interested in endings than beginnings. Uh, if you go on Google Images, there are a lot more sunsets than there are sunrises. So I'm not really sure why this is, but maybe because there's a kind of drama in the ending. There's a kind of tension. We all want to know how it all turns out. So how is climate change going to turn out? What is climate change the end of? That's what I'd like to talk about tonight. And so as I was preparing this lecture, I thought, well, there are a number of possibilities. One is the obvious one. It's the end of climate as we've known it. Another one is also fairly obvious. It's the end of nature as we have known it. And also the end of the Holocene period of geologic time. So I'll talk a little bit about those three ideas. But then I want to talk about a few things that are maybe a little less obvious and that we raise um, in this book. Another is the idea that it may end up being the end of science as we've known it, that climate change is such a challenge that we may have to rethink what we even think it means to do science or to be scientists. It may be the end of capitalism, the end of liberal democracy, and perhaps, as we suggest here, the end of Western civilization. So let's talk first about the most obvious one, the climate system as we've known it. This is incontrovertible because it's already happened. Our climate is already substantially different than it was prior to the late 20th century buildup of greenhouse gases. Now, why does this matter? Well, I think most people in this room know many of the changes that are happening make the climate system more severe. That is to say, for example, more energy in the climate system gives us more intense rains. More intense rains contribute to worse floods, as we've just seen in the last few days here in the United States. And we know why this is so. This is no mystery. A warmer atmosphere, it's basic thermodynamics. A warmer atmosphere can carry more moisture. So the amount of rain that can fall in any period of time is now greater than it used to be. It's basic physics. And this means that storm drains get overwhelmed and rivers overflow their banks. Just this week, we've seen a tragic cyclone, Cyclone Ide, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, uh, that hit uh, Africa. Now, of course, there are many factors that control the damage associated with severe storms, such as the robustness of the infrastructure. But one of the factors is climate change. And again, as we know, increased energy in the climate system overall, combined with warmer ocean waters and warmer atmosphere, creates the potential, the physical potential, for stronger, more deadly storms. And if a storm like that hits an area with weak resilience, weak infrastructure, the possibilities for enormous damage are very great. Even if it reaches an area with good infrastructure, like a city like New Orleans, the possibilities for damage are very great. Now, it's a popular denialist talking point to claim that the increased damage associated with major hurricanes in recent years is greater only because we have more people living in coastal regions. That claim is incorrect. It is true there are more people living in coastal regions, and so it is true that monetary damages, the billions of dollars in houses lost or, or whatever, that by itself is not a reliable indicator of the impact of climate change on storms. But we have a number of physical parameters, parameters that have nothing to do with where people live, such as the lowest recorded pressure in the eye of a storm, the largest geographic extent, and the length of the hurricane season, all of which have been breaking records, and none of which have to do with where people live. So one of my favorite examples, because I think it's really telling, is that in the Atlantic Basin, we now have hurricanes occurring both before hurricane season has started and after it has ended. 
And that's really telling, because what, do, what does it even mean to have a hurricane season? That's a historical expectation based on what used to be the case of when hurricanes would typically hit places like Florida and Cuba and Puerto Rico and, and the Bahamas. Um, but because the ocean is warmer than it used to be, hurricane season is now longer. Or if we look at the barometric pressure, so this is an absolute physical parameter measured uh, by scientists, by crazy scientists who fly airplanes through the eyes of hurricanes. If we look at the most intense Atlantic hurricanes as measured by the lowest barometric pressure, we see that eight out of the 10 most intense hurricanes since reliable record keeping has begun in the 1850s, eight out of 10 of these have occurred since 1980. We can also look at heat waves. Heat waves are one of the most serious and also most incontrovertible effects of global warming. Obviously, as the Earth gets hotter, we have more heat waves. And summer heat waves, as people, uh, most people know, are very serious. It's not just an inconvenience. They can be fatal, particularly for the elderly and people without access to cooling. One particularly well-studied example is the European heat wave of the summer of 2003. And I like to talk about this one because I was there with my family in Paris, right smack in the middle of this heat wave, and my children were looking at me like, Mom, why did you take us to Paris? You know? And they still talk about this terrible thing I did when they were young, how I took them to Paris in the summer of 2003. Temperatures above, across Europe were 20 to, 3 to, 20 to 30% above normal. And again, that is a statistical normal from the period before climate change. The temperature reached 99 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 Celsius, for more than a week in August in several parts of Europe. And there were 70,000 excess human deaths, 70,000 and above and beyond what would normally be expected in an ordinary August week at that time. There were also significant livestock and crop losses. Now, one irony of the very, and there's a long list of impacts that I could go into if we had more time, but one of my favorites is because it's so ironic, um, Defenders of nuclear power like to say that nuclear power is the or one of the important solutions to climate change. But the fact that people invoke that shows how people don't think about the way in which technology is not separate from human systems and not separate from natural systems. Because in fact, the high water temperatures and low water levels during this period shut down the French nuclear reactors just when demand was peaking. So the very heat wave that seems to make nuclear power something you might want to have actually made those facilities shut down at this crucial moment. Now, there's been a lot of scientific analysis of the 2003 summer since that time. And it's now been demonstrated that it was probably the hottest summer in Europe since at least AD 1500. So in other words, this heat wave was like nothing like anything that any of us in the modern period have experienced. Detection and attribution studies have concluded that anthropogenic global warming has doubled the likelihood of a heat wave of this type. Most recently, Christidis et al. in a paper in Nature Climate Change wrote, quote, events that would occur twice a century in the early 2000s are now expected to occur twice in a decade. So 10 times as more, more, free, as free, 10 times more frequently. And notice they're comparing to the early 2000s. So this is a, an increase, a tenfold increase, just in the last 15 years. For the more extreme threshold observed in 2003, the return time reduces from thousands of years in the late 20th century to about 100 years. So in other words, a kind of heat wave that would be more or less unheard of in a millennia, a millennia of life in Europe, now will occur at least once a century and possibly more. So all of this tells us that climate as we've known it, the climate around which people have built their lives and their communities and their infrastructures and their expectations, that climate no longer exists. So what do we lose when we lose the climate as we've known it? Well, obviously lives, property, money, but also maybe a sense of security if we no longer feel secure and safe in our homes, and maybe faith in a loving God. This is what my colleague Jim Antel, uh, um, Protestant minister believes. So there's a lot of things that begin to unfold when the world as we know it seems to be changing in hostile ways. And of course, it's not just physical effects. I'm trained originally as a physical scientist, so I tend to talk more about the science I know best. But we're also seeing many changes in biological systems. For example, spring thaw is coming earlier now in most parts of the world. And this disrupts the cycles of pollination because some plants now bloom 
before the birds that pollinate them have returned from, from the winter um, sojourns. Now, all of this has happened with a measured mean global temperature increase of just about one degree centigrade. But we are on track to an increase of three degrees or more. So this helps us begin to imagine that once a millennium heat wave that became once a century will become once a decade or once a year if climate change continues unabated. And this, of course, leads into the fact then that nature, as we have known it, has changed as well. So along with climate change, this is a change that has already happened too. Again, there are many different things I could speak about, but the most alarming, upsetting, really tragic one is what has happened to coral reefs around the globe. We have extremely good evidence of the death and destruction of coral reefs, because if we go back to the 1960s, and this audience looks old enough to remember Jacques Cousteau, we have fantastic underwater photographs of what healthy reefs looked like back in the 1960s. And we can compare those photographs with what's going on today. And it's frankly heartbreaking, just heartbreaking. Um, and some of these changes, even though they've been d developing over a long period of time, this is an example of the whole issue of tipping points that the students and I discussed this morning, uh, that in some cases a reef could be doing pretty well until the temperature reaches a threshold value that becomes higher than the corals can survive. And when that happens, the corals can die rather quickly. So we have this one photograph here, February 2016, a healthy reef. Uh, two months later, in April 2016, a mostly dead reef. Now, corals are particularly significant in that they are both biological and physical. The living reefs of today are the limestones of tomorrow. Ancient reefs are a major part of the geological record. And in fact, if you study geology, as I did as an undergraduate, one of the things you learn is to identify the solitary corals that developed in the early Paleozoic uh, and to distinguish them from the reef building corals that evolved later in the Paleozoic, this was a major transition in the geologic record because once reef building corals uh, evolve, suddenly you get these big limestone formations that you didn't have before. So this means that the global synchronous deaths of reefs will be evident in the rock record. This will be something that future geologists will see. So in other words, they won't just learn like I learned about the evolution of solitary corals into reef building corals. They'll also learn about the death of the reef building corals. So that's kind of tragic. And it's this idea that future geologists will see this in the geological record that has led to the conclusion that another thing that has ended is the Holocene, the geological time period that we used to live in, the geological period in which people evolved. We now live in a different geological time period, the Anthropocene. I'm a member of the Anthropocene Working Group uh, of the International Stratigraphic Commission. And a few years ago, our group was charged with answering the question, has the Holocene ended? Should the Anthropocene be recognized as a new unit in the geological time scale? And if so, uh, what are the markers of it? And when does it begin? So for the last several years, this committee has been working. We've issued a series of reports, papers, recommendations. We've voted many times, and we're voting again even as we speak. Um, and we have voted to make a formal recommendation for the Anthropocene to be recognized as a unit in the geological time scale. We've concluded that the Holocene has indeed ended, and that the scientific community should formally recognize a new geological time period where the effects of human activity are globally recognizable and will remain so into the future. We have a number of specific findings that the key geological markers align and therefore define a start for the Anthropocene somewhere between 1952 and 1955. So this is very specific, much more specific than earlier geological time periods. And this is based primarily on signals from nuclear testing and burning of fossil fuels. So in other words, Already by the 1950s, we can see evidence in the isotopic record of changes in carbon isotopes because of fossil fuel burning and the um, nuclear isotopes from atomic testing. Not coincidentally, these coins, or not by accident, these coincide with what Will Steffens has called the Great Acceleration, a period of exponential increase in population and resource use at the end of World War II. The strata that reflect this are globally distributed, so we can find the nuclear test signal across the globe, even in Antarctica. And therefore, we can be confident that they will be recognized by future geologists. 
And our next phase of research now is to de de define the type locations for the Anthropocene. Now, these are fairly specific scientific findings, and I present them to you just for you to give a sense, get a sense of what scientists are talking about when we talk about the Anthropocene, which may be different than what historians or sociologists or economists might be talk about. Talk about. But we still might want to address the question, does this matter? And I want to argue as a humanist, not just as a geologist, that the answer is yes. Because this is the first time in geological history, not just human history, but geological history, that the human imprint on the planet has become dominant. And in this sense, I think we can argue that Bill McKibben was right about the end of nature. If we understand nature to be that part of the world that was not put there by us and not controlled by us, that nature no longer exists. It is the end of nature as we have known it. Moreover, the human fingerprint is not only everywhere, but in many places it's dominant. So in many places, for example, the hydrologic cycle is no longer dominated by evapotranspiration and all those things you might have learned in ninth grade geography. It's actually dominated by human diversion of water. In many areas, we find that human forces are now as great or greater than geophysical ones. And so the old arguments about human insignificance in the face of geological time are no longer true. So when I was studying geology, we were taught that one of the most important contributions of geology to thinking, to human thinking, was that geologists showed us how insignificant we were. That humans used to think that we were the center of everything, but actually um, humans were nothing. And we had all these different metaphors to talk about how brief human time was compared to geological time. So Stephen Jay Gould used to talk about how if geological time was a clock, all of human history would be less than one second before midnight on that geological time. Or if it was a yardstick and we held out our hand to measure all of geological time, all of human history would be less than one swipe of a nail file against our fingernails. So just nothing. And that this was this great contribution for us to understand how nothing we were. Only now it turns out that actually we're not nothing anymore. Um, that's a pretty big conceptual shift. And it raises some interesting issues about moral and ethical responsibility in relation to the planet. So one example, for example, I was also told when I was in school that the solution to pollution was dilution. How many of you remember that, right? You know, the ocean was giant. You could just dump stuff in it, and it would get diluted, and it would all be fine. Or put, put pollution in the atmosphere, as long as your smokestacks were high enough, right? That's an argument you guys heard here in Ohio. It would be OK, because it would disperse, and it gave us acid rain. <laughs> OK, so we now know that that's not true. And that means we need a different way to think about how we use resources and what we do with the waste products of human activity, most obviously CO2, but also plastic, nitrate particulates, and a lot of other things. Johann Rockström of the Stockholm Resilience Institute argues this is the proof that we have to take seriously that there really are planetary limits. So even if maybe the Club of Rome people got it Maybe they were a little too soon. Maybe we weren't actually up against those limits yet at that time. But there are planetary limits. We can't go on forever putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and not expect to see adverse consequences. Put another way, the oceans and the atmosphere are not garbage dumps. So this then leads to two interrelated issues. One is the issue of science, and the other is the issue of capitalism. So let's talk about science first. In Merchants of Doubt, Eric Conway and I were rather mindful and careful about telling a story that was not the fault of scientists. That is to say that scientists were primarily the victims in the story. What we showed in the story was how people who were ideologically motivated, think tanks, the fossil fuel industry, and a small number of scientists, mostly physicists, had constructed this narrative that was intended to disparage climate science and discredit si climate scientists. So those scientists, those climate scientists, were essentially a victims in the story of a disinformation campaign. Now, of course, there were things that we thought scientists might have done differently, but we didn't want to get into that in this book because we thought it would dilute the story and in a way distract attention from the main event, which was this organized campaign of disinformation, <clears throat> disparagement, discrediting, and denial. Lots of D words and deception. But in some important way, I think that we do have to acknowledge that science as it has practiced, as we have practiced it, 
has actually failed us. And I don't mean that the individual climate scientists in this, in this story necessarily failed, but science as an enterprise has not really been able to deal with the problem of climate change. So let me explain what I mean by that. If we go back to the early modern period, the period that historians recognize as the beginning of what we would consider modern science, there's been a prevailing assumption a kind of organizing assumption in a way that science, sorry, that knowledge is power. This is associated most famously with Francis Bacon, and it was his argument, which he made famously in uh, several books, including The Great Instauration, it was his argument for the reason why men should pursue science and why kings and other patrons should support it. Because science would give us knowledge, and that knowledge would give us the power to improve our lives. So science was viewed as an empowering thing, and that was good. In the 20th century, this same basic construct, this idea that knowledge was power, motivated men like Roger Revelle and James Hansen to alert policymakers to the threat of man-made climate change. These men assumed that if our political leaders understood the science, if they understood the threat, then they would act on that knowledge. They would use their political power to act on scientists' knowledge. So knowledge would become power by being channeled through a line of communication. Well, as we all know, that didn't happen. Climate change got worse. Roger Revelle died before any significant actions were taken to address the issue. And Jim Hansen got arrested. Now, most of this was not scientists' fault. As I've already said, scientists faced a highly organized, well-funded, and very professional network determined to confuse the American people about climate change and to block policy action. But it does raise some questions about how scientists have understood what climate science is, how they've tried to communicate it, and how we've all thought about the relationship between knowledge and power. So in general, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, but I think it's one that's basically true, Scientists have tend to view climate change as a problem in physical science. That is to say, we viewed climate change as a scientific problem. And the key parameters that climate scientists have focused on have been physical parameters, things like the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we've all heard the number 350. I think we all know that CO2 has now passed 400, right? We hear these numbers about the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere all the time. And we also hear numbers like the mean global temperature increase that results when those greenhouse gas concentrations increase. Now, viewed this way, scientists have repeatedly stated that the cause of global warming is the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And of course, that's true. It's something I've quoted many times in my own work. We know that climate change is caused by increased greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. I've said that myself a hundred times. But we could equally well say that climate change is a political, social, and economic problem, and that actually it's causes people. And that scientists focus on the physical aspects of climate change have actually obscured this point. And so I want to read another section now from the book that gets a little bit into this question of how scientists have framed the problem of climate change, and with this focus primarily on the physical scientific aspects and not some of the other important elements. It is difficult to understand why humans did not respond appropriately in the early penumbral period when preventive measures were still possible. Many have sought an answer in the general phenomenon of human adaptive optimism, which later proved crucial for survivors. Even more elusive to scholar is why scientists, whose job it was to understand the threat and warn their societies, and who thought they did understand the threat, and that they were warning their societies, failed to appreciate the full magnitude of climate change. To shed light on this question, some scholars have paint, pointed to the epistemic structure of Western science, particularly in the late 19th and 20th centuries, which was organized both intellectually and institutionally around, quote, disciplines, in which specialists developed a high level of expertise in a small area of inquiry. This reductionist approach, sometimes credited to the 17th century French philosopher René Descartes, was not fully developed until the late 19th century 
oh, sorry, but not fully developed until the late 19th century, was believed to give intellectual power and vigor to investigators by focusing on singular elements of complex problems. Tractability was a guiding ideal of the time. Problems that were too large or too complex to be solved in their totality were divided into smaller, more manageable elements. While reductionism proved powerful in many domains, particularly quantum physics and medical diagnostics, it impeded investigations of complex systems. Reductionism also made it different for scientists to articulate the threat posed by climate change, since many experts did not actually know very much about aspects of the problem beyond their own expertise. And then in parentheses, other environmental problems face similar challenges. For example, for years, scientists did not understand the role of polar stratigraphic clouds in severe ozone depletion in the still glaciated Antarctic regions because chemists working on the chemical reactions did not even know there were clouds in the polar stratosphere. And that's a true story. Even scientists who had a broad view of climate change often felt it would be inappropriate for them to articulate it because that would require them to speak beyond their expertise and seem to be taking credit for other people's work. Responding to this, scientists and political leaders created the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to bring together the diverse specialists needed to speak to the whole problem. Yet, perhaps because of the diversity of specialist views represented, perhaps because of pressures from governmental sponsors, or perhaps because of the constraints of scientific culture already mentioned, the IPCC had trouble speaking in a clear voice. Other scientists promoted the idea of system science, complexity science, and most pertinent to our discussion here, earth system science. But these so-called holistic approaches still focused almost entirely on natural systems, omitting from consideration the social components. Yet in many cases, the social components were the dominant system drivers. It was often said, for example, that climate change was caused by increased atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. Scientists understood that those greenhouse gases were accumulating because of the activities of human beings, deforestation and fossil fuel combustion, yet they rarely said that the cause was people and their patterns of conspicuous consumption. So, I want to say that the cause of climate change is people, but it's also not all people, or that is to say, it's not all people equally. And this is the central argument of the Pope's encyclical on climate change and inequality, that it's really rich people, mostly in Europe, North America, Australia, and Japan, something like 90% of all the greenhouse gas emissions that have been emitted to date have been emitted by about 12 countries. And you may say, well, what about China? But the fact is the average American produces three times the greenhouse gases of the average Chinese person, uh, nine times the greenhouse gases of the average Pakistani. And this brings the Pope to, into a discussion of capitalism. And so it should bring us there as well. <coughs> so we can't talk about climate change and capitalism without talking about Naomi Klein, because this is her central argument in her book, This Changes Everything. She argues that capitalism is to blame for climate change. So in effect, that the cause of climate change isn't actually people, it's people living in capitalist economic systems. And therefore, she wants to say that the only way to stop climate change is to bring the era of capitalism to an end. When she says this changes everything, what she means is that we have to change our economic system. We have to move past capitalism. Now, I find this argument a bit ironic because, of course, this is what climate change deniers think, too. They concluded that addressing climate change would put us on the road to socialism and from there on the road to serfdom. So that's drawing on Friedrich von Hayek's famous book. And so they refused to accept that climate change was real and serious because they couldn't see any way to address it without feeling like we were opening up a back door to socialism. And in fact, in an early interview when her book first came out, Naomi Klein said that she first got the idea from her, for her book by reading ours, when she realized, as she said, that the merchants of doubt were right, that capitalism is the cause of climate change. Well, so this is a complicated argument, and I think there's a lot in her work to agree with. For example, she says this, which I agree with. Our economy is at war with many forms of life on Earth, including human life. 
What the climate needs to avoid collapse is a contraction of humanity's use of resources. What our economic model demands to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed, and it's not the laws of nature. So here's what I think is right about this argument. Nearly all economists have agreed that our current economic system fails to account for what they would call external costs. In fact, the whole phrase external costs really tells you what the problem is, that things like pollution and um, destruction of habitat, that these are viewed as external to the economic system, not part and parcel of the economic system. And there are many, many examples of this. The most obvious one in relation to climate change is that when we buy gas, the price we pay does not reflect the damage that fossil fuels do. But it's not just gasoline. It's really all the goods and services we use. We don't pay for the waste products. We don't pay when we buy anything, a computer, a book, a dress, earrings. We don't pay for the cost of the waste that have been produced. Those wastes, in most cases, are just dumped somewhere, and the cost passed on to some community somewhere that takes that waste. But is this really a problem of capitalism? This is really, I think, one of the key questions. Because we know that environmental destruction was as bad or worse under Soviet communism than it was under American and European capitalism at that same time. And of course, just because the merchants of doubt thought they were defending capitalism freedom doesn't mean they were right about that. In fact, the whole argument of our book is that they weren't right, that they were misguided, that they had this misguided association of capitalism with personal freedom, that those are actually two different things, but in their own ideology, they get conflated. And so I want to argue that it doesn't follow that the only way to fix climate change is to, quote, change everything. And in fact, that conclusion worries me greatly, because it seems to me it would be a whole lot easier to change a few things than to try to change everything. Now, obviously, there's a lot more we can say about this, and I'm happy to um, answer questions on this point. But when I was trying to decide what to say about all this, I decided to go to the same website that had the Naomi Klein quotes and to see if they had any quotes from me. And they do, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> and here's the quotation they have from me. It's from a discussion of the Papal Encyclical where I said about the Pope's message, it really is a very radical call to reject materialism as our central value and to think about the sanctity of life and what that really means if we take it seriously. So one of the questions is, can we reject materialism or at least reject it as a central driving force in our economy and still be capitalists? Or put another way, can we find a way to adjust our system so we pay the true cost of goods and services and don't externalize the damage and so that rewards could be more equitably distributed? This is one of the things I'm thinking about in my current book project, where I'm looking at questions of, that we've had over the last 100 years about the regulation of capitalism. So maybe what we're talking about is socialism, but maybe not. Maybe it's just some kind of full cost accounting capitalism, where we actually do account for the true costs of economic activity. Some people have proposed the idea of a circular economy, where we wouldn't just throw away waste, but we would reuse them, recycle, or find some way to to consider the waste stream as part of the economy and not external to it. Or maybe reading the Pope, what we're really talking about is a more compassionate capitalism where we find ways to distribute the benefits more equitably. And if it's not less a fair, how about just the idea of a well-regulated capitalism? So these are all ideas that I'm playing with. Love to hear what you folks think about it. So then we get on to the really crux issues uh, the issues of liberal democracy and Western civilization. So in the book, The End of History, which I noted earlier on in this talk, Francis Fukuyama linked the so-called end of history to the triumph. Sorry, I made triumph look like Trump. That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> to the triumph and universalization of Western liberal democracy. He wrote, what we may be witnessing is not the end of the Cold War, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of man's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy. Well, that certainly didn't happen. We live in a world today where liberal democracy is threatened from many sides. And really, as a historian, the idea that we could ever come to the end of man's ideological evolution, I mean, that's just a ridiculous thing, in my opinion, uh, for, you know, speaking from the perspective of the historian. The idea that man would stop thinking, 
is actually not only ridiculous, but actually a little scary. And the idea that Fukuyama could have seen that as a good thing is also a little weird. But in any event, um, it might seem, sorry, it might seem that Fukuyama is not that pertinent to our point, but I think he's very pertinent. Because it's the same kind of ideological self, ideologically self-righteous view of liberal democracy that it would inevitably triumph has also informed the market fundamentalism between climate denial. So let me explain that point a little more. The original climate change deniers were cold warriors who were deeply anti-communist. Their whole worldview had been framed during the Cold War, and they accepted a kind of Manichaean view of a cosmic conflict between East and West capitalism and communism. At the end of the Cold War, when Soviet communism failed, they declared the end of communism and the triumph of capitalism. And they linked that triumph, like Fukuyama, to the triumph of liberal democracy, insisting that these two things went hand in hand. And this was the core of their argument for the defense of capitalism, because by defending capitalism, they claimed they were defending liberal democracy. But they went further than that. They also made the argument that essentially went like this. If capitalism is good, then the best version of capitalism is its purest form and anything that restricts it is bad. Environmentalists want to restrict the use of fossil fuels and regulate greenhouse gases. Therefore, environmentalism is bad. And this explains which other, something which otherwise would be a bit mystifying in this whole story, which is this huge shift in the Republican Party, which used to be um, very committed to conservationism, environmental protection until the 1970s, Republicans were on board with environmental protection. In many areas, were actually better than Democrats. And then this giant shift, right around 1988, and opinion polls and voting records in Congress show this, right around 1988, at the end of the Cold War, this big shift where Republicans turn against environmental protection and environmental regulation. So that's at the end of the Cold War. That's sort of right between 88 and 92 that we see this very big shift in Republican thinking on environmental issues. But it's not just Republicans. We see this in what I call the neoliberal extension, which takes place, begins in the 1990s under Clinton and runs through the 2000s. This idea that regulation in general is kind of a bad thing, that we should try to avoid it as much as possible, that we should try to deregulate financial markets, trucking, um, it actually begins under Jimmy Carter with trucking and, and aviation, but then it gets picked up a lot more in the Clinton era with the deregulation of um, the financial markets, loosening of regulations on pharmaceuticals, which not incidentally gives us the opioid crisis. That's a whole other story. And this actually has a name. It's called the Washington Consensus. And it was very much promoted by Bill Clinton in <coughs> conjunction with Tony Blair in the UK. But what have we seen since that time? What we've seen is that the market has failed to fix climate change or even to respond seriously. And now we face the threat that disasters may displace millions of people, cause food shortage, disease outbreaks, perhaps even resurge in famine. And our argument in this book and in our continuing work is that de liberal democracies are going to find it very hard to address these crises in liberal ways. And we're going to find it very hard to continue to defend the ideas of personal individual liberty and autonomy in the face of these massive crises. And so with that, I'd like to go back to the book one more time and read um, the section of the book that deals explicitly with this argument. Given the events recounted here, it is hard to imagine why anyone in the 20th century would have argued against government protection of the natural environment in which human life depends. Yet such arguments were not only made, they dominated the public sphere. The ultimate paradox was that neoliberalism, meant to ensure individual freedom above all, led eventually to a situation that necessitated large-scale government intervention. <coughs> Classical liberalism was centered on the idea of individual liberty. And in the 18th century, most individuals had precious little of it, economic or otherwise. But by the mid 20th century this, century, this situation had changed dramatically. Slavery was formally outlawed in the 19th century, and monarchies and other forms of empire were increasingly replaced by various forms of liberal democracy. In the West, individual freedoms, both formal and informal, probably peaked around the time von Hayek was writing. So here we're referring to Friedrich von Hayek, who we discussed earlier in the book, or shortly thereafter. So that's around 1944. 
By the end of the 20th century, Western citizens still held the formal rights of voting, various forms of free thought and expression, and freedom of employment and travel. But actionable freedom was decreasing. First, as economic power was increasingly concentrated in a tiny elite who came to be known as the 1%, and then in a political elite propelled to power as the climate crisis forced dramatic interventions to relocate citizens displaced by sea level rise and desertification to contain contagion and to prevent mass famine. And so the developments that the neoliberals most dreaded, centralized government and loss of personal choice, was rendered essential by the very policies that they had put in place. And this is a point that I think historians would do well to discuss more, because many people have forgotten. If we think about times in US history where there have been gigantic violations of civil rights, personal rights, human rights, often they've been associated with disease and contagion, or with the articulation of a threat as a form of disease and contagion. So if we think about forced sterilization of American citizens during the eugenics period, much of that argument was based on the idea that eugenics was a medical threat, or I should say, eugenics was a response to a medical threat. And we know that over 30,000 people in California alone were sterilized um, without their consent during that period, and many more in other states we know more about California because they kept better records, but we know that many thousands of people in other states were similarly affected. So this theme that the disasters that climate change will bring are the sorts of things that will justify or seemingly even necessitate the loss of individual liberty, we felt was such an important theme that we tried to make it sort of upfront and central in the film version of Merchants of Doubt. And so I wanted to show you one clip, and then I'll end with one final reading, again, that just tries to underscore this point. So this is from the ending, the last few minutes of the film version of our book, Merchants of Doubt. As sea level rises and hurricanes become more intense, people get killed, their houses and communities get destroyed. Or think about heat waves and droughts that ruin agricultural communities. All of these are problems that it will require government intervention to address. The great irony of the story, to me, is that people who don't like big government are going to get more of it. And we're going to see more money being spent on dealing with the aftermath of these disasters. There will be billions of dollars in real estate losses, but more than that, people will die. That's why it matters. That's why this is meaningful for us and not just for polar bears or people in Bangladesh. That's why so many people in the scientific community now are really starting to talk in very worried tones because there's, I think, a growing sense in the scientific community that we're running out of time to prevent a train wreck. As so finally, we get to the question of Western civilization as a whole. And for that, I'd like to read from the epilogue of our book. As the devastating effects of the great collapse began to appear, the nation states with democratic governments, both parliamentary and Republican, were at first unwilling and then unable to deal with the unfolding crisis. As food shortages and disease outbreaks spread and sea level rose, these governments found themselves without the infrastructure and organizational ability to quarantine and relocate people. In China, the situation was somewhat different. Like other post-communist nations, China had taken steps toward liberalization, but still retained a powerful centralized government. When sea level rise began to threaten coastal areas, China rapidly built new inland cities and villages and relocated more than 250 million people to higher, safer ground. The relocation was not easy. Many older citizens, as well as infants and young children, could not manage the transition. Nonetheless, survival rates exceeded 80%. To many survivors, in what might be viewed as a final irony of our story, China's ability to weather disastrous climate change vindicated the necessity of centralized government, leading to the establishment of the Second People's Republic of China, also sometimes referred to as neo-communist China, and inspiring similar structures in other reformulated nations. <laughs> 
By blocking anticipatory action, neoliberals did more than expose the tragic flaws in their own system. They fostered expansion of the forms of governance they most abhorred. Today, we remain engaged in a vigorous intellectual discussion of whether, now that the climate system has finally stabilized, decentralization and re-democratization may be considered. Many academics in the spirit of history's great thinkers hope that such matters may be freely debated. Others consider that outcome wishful in light of the dreadful events of the past and reject the reappraisal that we wish to invite here. Evidently, the penumbra falls even today and likely will continue to fall for years, decades, and perhaps even centuries to come. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I guess thank you may not be quite the right, uh, <laughs> right word, but uh, we appreciate uh, the presentation very much. And I'm sure there are some questions or comments from the audience. If you raise your hand, I will come over with a microphone so that you can be heard. Hi, thanks a lot for uh Good talk. Um, uh, just a quick question. What evidence is there that the professed um, uh, commitment to uh, free market solutions to everything is genuine and not just like a lie mm. that bankers and, and fossil fuel companies tell so that it sounds objective and not strictly in their interest? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, it was something that Eric Conway and I really grappled with when we were writing Merchants of Doubt. And I think, like a lot of things, the answer is both. And in our, our new book, we're actually looking specifically at that question. And so what we want to argue is that it is both and that we can actually track an interesting story. So we've been going back to the early 20th century and finding what we're calling the roots of market fundamentalism. And we can find it going back to debates over child labor in the early century. And there's no question that in many of those early debates, the market free enterprise arguments kind of those that time the term free enterprise was sort of the term of art uh, was highly cynical highly cynical but at the same time there are other people who i think well, what happens is sort of a couple of different tracks so meanwhile in europe you've got ludwig von mises and friedrich von hayek the people who are developing neoliberalism as a kind of economic framework I think that for von Hayek, it actually was authentic. And I think it was tied up with his experience of European totalitarianism. And if you read von Hayek, I mean, like a lot of these great thinkers, he's much more sophisticated than his followers make him out to be. So he's quite sophisticated. And he acknowledges that his argument is not an argument for a blanket rejection of government. And then he even uses pollution as, his, as one of his examples of a place where you clearly do need government. So one of the interesting things we found in the archive is that when von Hayek's book is published, a group of reactionary businessmen in the United States discover it. And they begin to promote it in the United States because they say, oh, look, this is great. They didn't get the idea from von Hayek, but they realize they can use it. And so we just, Eric Conway just sent me some stuff from the archive two days ago. J. Howard Pugh, who was the CEO of Sun Oil Company, he takes out a full page ad in major newspapers and magazines around the country promoting von Hayek's book. Thank you. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, You're welcome. You present the um, threat of climate disaster as a, a loss, a real specter, and a loss of the end of liberal democracy mm. and Western civilization. Although in the narrative form of your presentation of that, we get a kind of um, reprise of civilization and civilized life mm. in the voice of um, the person from 2362 right. or whatever in the right. Second China Republic. Right. And so in some ways, our concerns about the end of civilization are laid because it, uh. it is revised. I wonder if you could speak a little to, because in the background of human civilization at that time will be a tremendous loss of biological diversity mm -hmm. and the richness of life. And I wonder if you could address a little bit the difference between our liberal democracies and civilization today in a rich world and the reemergence of uh, civilization in the future, but the impoverished world that, yeah. that might be. That's a great question. So we wrote this book originally as an article. We, it was going to be an article for a journal. And then an editor who read it said, he thought it would make a nice little book. And so we, we sort of made a decision not to expand it too much beyond the original article. 
and so there were a lot of other things we we could have talked about. We also could have talked about ocean acidification. That would have, that's to me like one of the obvious things that's missing. The whole biological side is an obvious piece that's missing. The reason we made the decision not to add more to it, well, one was the editor was happy with it as it was, and we we're like, wow, our editor is happy with this book as it is. Maybe we just leave it alone. <laughs> but but the bigger reason, the conceptual reason, we were really trying to point at, focus the, the point on this issue that. The merchants of doubt that we say claim that they're defending liberal democracy. And I do believe that some of them actually believe that in their own minds. But we wanted to make the point that it's not going to work out the way they think. It's actually going to go the other way. Because the longer we wait to fix this, the harder it's going to be to manage it with the tools that we have in liberal democracy. So that was really the point of the book. And that's what we were trying to get to. And that's why we didn't then get engaged in some of these other issues about loss of biological <laughs> diversity. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think that even if we come out of this you know, sort of relatively unscathed, we won't really be unscathed, because we will have had this huge loss. And sometimes it's hard to talk to people about what that means, because I think that so many people live so disengaged from nature nowadays that it's a little difficult sometimes to really even talk about that meaning. And I think, you know, there are a lot of people like Wes Jackson, Terry Tempest Williams, you know, a lot of nature writers, like I don't consider myself a nature writer, right, who are trying to engage that issue. And I think it's very tricky. And it's also tricky because it's hard to talk about it without sounding elitist, right? Because um, we often haven't an image of people who spend a lot of time in the wilderness or, you know, nature as being sort of rich white people who can afford to do this or afford to, you know, go diving in the reefs. Of course, that's not true either, right? We know that there's tons of evidence that lots of people of all different sizes, shapes, colors, and economic uh, status enjoy being outdoors, and more than just enjoy it, that it's actually really important for mental health. There's a great article that just came out the other day that I tweeted because um, it was actually a scientific study that showed that adults, people who have spent time, more time in nature as children, are happier and mentally healthier as adults. And I actually, my daughter sent this to me, and I said, see, that's why we dragged you camping. <laughs> you know? So, um, and, and there was actually, there's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things to be said about this. When I was in the archives last year, I spent some time with the papers of Russell Train, who was the first head of the Council of Economic uh, Council on Environmental Quality under Richard Nixon. Train was a really interesting guy. He was very much a sort of old school Republican environmentalist of the, almost like the Teddy Roosevelt type. He came out of the conservation uh, foundation, was, became interested in conservation because he went to Africa and became enamored of the great animals and wanting to protect elephants and things like that. But over time, his vision of conservation expanded and he wrote an incredibly interesting um, report in 1968 where he pointed out that after the race riots in the 1960s and Watts, when people were asked, people in those communities were asked what they wanted, what would make their lives better, many of them said parks, green spaces, recreation. And he pointed this out. He said, this is not just an issue for rich people, right? This is an issue for all Americans. So he, I'm a great admirer of Russell Tran. I think he was an incredibly insightful person. And we've kind of lost sight of that, I think. I mean, not all of us. There are definitely people who are working on this issue. Um, so I think we need to find ways to talk more about that so that people will understand that the loss of biological diversity um, is something really profound. And it's not just um, you know, ecosystem services. I personally hate the term ecosystem services because I feel like it's so utilitarian. And it makes it sound like nature is only worthwhile to the extent that we can monetize it and turn it into like drugs or something. So it's much more profound than that. Um, so we didn't talk about it in our book just because we couldn't do everything. <laughs> but it's not to say that it isn't hugely important. And then the other piece, of course, is there's a reason, right? I mean, we're trying to make the point here. I mean, in a way, this is an anti-Fukuyama book, right? There's this glorification of Western civilization by the neoliberals and a kind of disrespect for knowledge traditions in lots of other places. And so we're kind of trying to make the point if anybody's going to come out of this relatively unscathed, it may well be China. And if you think about it, China is the most persistent civilization on Earth. They've come through a lot of things before. So if anyone's going to come through this one, it's more likely to be them than us. So we may think that we're better and superior, but the historical evidence doesn't really support that hypothesis. Uh, thank you. And I'll modify the talk by saying, hopefully, action-inspiring talk. Thank you. Um, 
So my question is about your work around the labeling of the Anthropocene. Because we've been waiting, the labeling of the Anthropocene. Um, Because while we've been waiting for the deliberations in in the side of the committee for the so-called golden spike, the the thing they're going to label it out, we got an age, the last age of the Holocene labeled after a province or state in India, uh, the Malay, you can say it better than I can, the Megalayan age. That signified that the last 4,000 years of the Holocene uh, was to be named after the drought. Mm-hmm. So that ended in 1950. So in some sense, that appears to be coordinated with mm-hmm. what you're saying, which is that the Great Acceleration, starting the year I was born, so to speak, uh, uh, is now um, going to be the, the starting point of the, of the Anthropocene. So were there conflicts uh, amongst the different parties in the Geological Society around the Holocene and the next oh, yeah. age. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. What are, what's the downside, in your opinion, of labeling this next epoch, ah. the Anthropocene? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Well, of course, there's a group of scientists. There's like 24 of us who have been majorly active and have been co-authors on some of the papers. And then there's like, I don't know how many additional people who have been somewhat involved in one degree or another. So of course, we've had giant arguments about all these things. Um, There have been sort of two main levels of the arguments. One has been about this issue of what the Anthropocene is, like an age, a stage, an epoch, an era, you know, like that whole thing. And I haven't been that involved in that argument because I'm not a stratigrapher by training, and I haven't had the time to kind of delve into the arguments on that level. So that's one thing. And that's a, you know, a technical argument, but it also has sort of broader philosophical ramification. The main um, sort of conceptual argument we've had has been about the starting date, and what we could call the early, middle, and late Anthropocene argument. So some people have made the argument, Warren Rudderman particularly is associated with this position, that humans have been altering the environment ever since we evolved. And certainly if you think about Native American communities, indigenous people who used fire to transform the landscape, we have a lot of evidence of that. Uh, We certainly have quite a bit of evidence of the human role in the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. So the idea that humans somehow, so some people would say if we place the start of the Anthropocene around the time of the Great Acceleration, that that's discounting or downplaying the substantial evidence of human impact before. And if the Anthropocene, the name, is about humans and the role of humans, then it's wrong to discount that earlier effect. The counter argument to that is well, this is, remember, this is a geological question, not an archaeological or, or anthropological question. So for geologists, particularly for stratigraphers, the question becomes, yes, but when does this become a globally recognized synchronous signal? And that argument won the day in our group, because remember, we're reporting to the International Commission on Stratigraphy, and we've been asked to view this as stratigraphers or geologists thinking about stratigraphy, uh, which is a different question than some other ways it could be framed. Now, when we made that decision, there were some people in the group who criticized us for being political and claimed that we were being overly influenced by a notion of the Anthropocene tied up with climate change, and particularly associated with Paul Crutzen, and that we were um, not being properly scientifically objective for this reason, but that was countered with the argument about global synchronicity. And the global synchronicity argument won the day. And I support that argument. I think that's correct. So when we say that the Anthropocene starts you know, after World War II, uh, we're not saying that there's no human impact prior to that, but we're saying that the human impact doesn't have the global um, observability that we absolutely do see after 1945, 1950. Forgive me for pushing the second No, it's okay, yeah. Do you, have some, do you see some downside to that label? Yeah, I do. I mean, I take the argument. I mean, I take the argument that the human impact doesn't just suddenly start in 1945. I mean, I think that's clearly true. Um, and so you could argue, and again, Warren Redman did argue this, that it would have been better to have started the Anthropocene when humans evolved and had to have an early, middle, and late Anthropocene. But then he, so then, I'm not sure if he made this argument or if other people did, 
But then the question is, so are we in the late Anthropocene? But then, of course, late is a bad term to give to anything that's not finished, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was a tricky, I think it was a tricky question. And that's why, in the end, we, we kept going back to this question of what would be stratigraphically recognizable. But there are definitely people, um, you know, people who are not stratigraphers who would say this doesn't make sense to them if you think of this as a more historical or political. And there, I know there are some historians who have made arguments for widespread human alteration of the environment, let's say, in medieval Europe. You could think about agriculture, for example. So there are some historians who would say that what we've done downplays the significance of what we know about human impacts on the environment in the Middle Ages or any other time period you might choose. But again, it gets back to this issue of the breadth, the depth, the intensity of the signal. So yes, Romans moved water around. Yes, um, I don't know, you know, Native Americans burned a lot of forests, right? These things definitely occurred, and they're definitely meaningfully historically, but it's not clear that they reached the level of being a geological signal. Okay, we have, we have time for one more question here in this uh, portion, uh, but I'll encourage you all uh, afterwards to corral our speaker if, you, if, you, uh, if I've missed you somehow. Thank you. Thank you for an interesting talk. I wanted to speak very specifically about um, the intellectual inheritance we, we have uh, is often disregarded of the intellectual movement, the sort of the concept of the limits of growth, mm -hmm. and in particularly commend an econ economist who wrote about that uh, as an economist speaking to other economists, Herman Daly. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, his work. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and how that's an alternative way of thinking about alternatives to uh, like the socialist uh, right. alternative to to, uh, to capitalism. Yeah, I definitely know Daly's work. I've taught it. Um, I taught a class for a few years when I was still at UCSD called like the, it was like the informal title was the greatest hits of environmentalism, and we did teach Daly as one of our books in that class. Um, if you know of other things that would be relevant, I'd love to hear from you because what Eric and I are hoping to do in this new book is to have a chapter towards the end of the book called Alternative Capitalisms. And the argument we want to make is that capitalism isn't one thing. That if you think, look at capitalism, you know, in the period of Adam Smith, managerial capitalism in the late 19th century, the Gilded Age, capitalism in the time of the New Deal, capitalism now, I mean, there have been very, very profound differences in how governments have engaged or not in the marketplace and what kinds of restrictions and regulations we had. I mean, one of the conspicuous things about the neoliberal period here in the United States is the repeal of many of the regulations that were put into place um, in the New Deal. So I was just reading the other day about the Holding Act of 1935, which was put in place to deal with abuses um, on the part of monopolistic practices on the part of the electricity industry. This was repealed in, I think it was 2005. So it's like we almost forgot the lessons of the Great Depression and the New Deal, and now we have to learn them again. So what we want to argue is just like, you know, we wouldn't Historians would never allow anyone to talk about religion as if it was one thing or the state as if it's one thing, right? We know now that those f terms are way too capacious. There, have been, there are many forms of religious expression. There have been many forms of state and government. And there have been significant differences in the forms of capitalism that we've seen. And so part of the argument we want to make is, is there a way to think through this in which we can think about you know, what I would like to call a more well-regulated or well-managed capitalism that takes into account some of these big problems that unregulated capitalism doesn't deal with. But we haven't written that chapter yet, so if you have suggestions, please tell me, because I'd really be interested in um, hearing from people on that. Well, one of the, uh, one of the more entertaining parts of uh, my position at the Humanities Center is to be able to start stimulating conversations one of the more depressing aspects is I have to end them. Uh, <laughs> and so at this point, I do want to uh, thank Naomi for getting uh, us off to a great start on conversations about nature and the humanities. So uh, please join me in thanking her one more time. <laughs>